Chapter 69, The Bounty Hunters. That's a good whore. Glad you've learned your place. All the whip cuts took away from your looks. The slaver leader remarks as she gets down on her knees to pleasure her. She has to do this. She has to do this or her remaining children will be slaughtered like her poor little Japina or taken away and sold like her little boy. She manages to keep the sorrow off her face. It only excites this one. It only, her slave collar deactivates. It startles her so much for the unending humming to suddenly stop that she flinches back in shock. The slaver grabs her by the back of the head just before the door crashes open. Hoorah, bitch! An enormous tret man bellows as he rushes through and shoots the slaver clear in the torso with a strange weapon that lets out a bright flash before the slaver's chest then head each explode as something crashes into both of them. Hey, are you okay? Wait a minute. You wouldn't know a young cobe by the name of Hugh Hugh, would you? He asks, and her heart nearly stops. You, you, is your name Humir? He asks, and she dumbly nods. He'll be glad to see you, and you'll be meeting his wives after, the strange pale tret says, and her jaw drops. Now, let's get you out of that collar. Shut down or not, it can't be comfortable, he remarks kneeling down to her level and pulling out a key. Although I must admit, when Hugh Hugh described his mother and sisters as a gobes, I had so many questions. What's the question? Boys take after their fathers, girls their mother, Hugh Mir says, and he shrugs as he inserts the key and unlatches the horrible device. It's just odd not something that happens back home, so it caught me off guard. He remarks as he tosses away the bomb collar and she rubs her neck. She's free. She's finally free. A sneaking suspicion comes to her and she pinches herself on the thigh. The pain is real. This is real. This isn't a dream? She needs a little confirmation. You're free. Vuxa is under new management and one of the more vehement laws is no slavery. So all slaves are freed and all slavers executed, he says. And she stares at him for a moment before tears threaten to overwhelm her. She starts to sob and her frame shakes. He kneels down and gives her a hug. It's okay, Humir. You're going to be okay. Now let's get you out of here, he says before a massive blast shakes the floor and she jumps on him for protection with a shriek. It's okay. That was just the bomb boys having their fun with the rest of the slavers. The one you were with was the only one with a hostage, so we couldn't just blow up this part of the building too. Hostage? She asks. You. We're not giving these scumbags even a hint of victory. They die. Everyone they've enslaved is free and alive, and we're going to remake this place into an automated mine. He says. We? Like I said, we're taking over. In ten years, you won't be able to recognize Vuxa. In ten years, Vuxa will be where you bring your children to grow up strong, but safe. This armpit of the galaxy is getting cleaned out and made righteous. Why armpit? She asks, after a few moments as her emotions come back under control. Pardon? Why do you compare it to an armpit? She asks, and he chuckles. I only look like a tret. My species has a cooling method that has a side effect of making us stink. The armpit is one of the worst places that can be brought up in polite company. He remarks before rising up and carrying her with him. Now, let's get you to the transport. This is the last camp we're hitting. Once we're out of here, this monument to pain and sorrow is going bye-bye in a big way. What's happening to me next? She asks as he quickly looks around the room and pulls out a few things before leading her out. Our first order is to get everyone out of danger, meaning someplace safe and medically healthy. Well fed, too. After that, we start putting families back together and see what kind of healing on the mental side of things people need. He explains leading her down the hallway with room after room burnt out and damaged. The shattered bodies of numerous slavers greet her each time and she makes a point of only looking at the large knot tret that is rescuing her. Then we see from there. 
He leads her out of the building and towards a large transport where the sounds of laughter and crying echoes from the open hatch. Near it are several massive emplaced weapons and a few spotters. All of them these strange off-tret men as numerous, much more normal Nagasha, Felid, Tret, and Arachna woman patrol around clearly looking for trouble. Here she is, last girl here. Her savior announces to the rest and they start breaking things down and one of them, slight bags under his eyes but an excited smile on his face approaches her before kneeling down to her level. Hello there, I am Special Agent Terrence Brown, codename Itchy. My fellow demolitions trooper, Commander Jean-Luc Martin here, have a gentleman's agreement. Itchy says, introducing himself to her and she blinks in confusion. Demolitions troopers? What kind of military uses men? Long story short, we both wanted to press the big button for blowing all these slaver camps sky high, but we couldn't agree. So we came to a compromise. The last freed slave gets to press the button and shatter the whole thing, and you, my dear, are the last one out. He says before pulling out a strange device that looks like a broken off handle. He shows her what parts to hold down and what to press. She pulls the trigger like part, flips up the top and presses the button. A decade of pain and suffering goes up in a massive ball of fire and a concussive boom. The shockwave tousles her hair, and for a moment she wonders if the weak pressure will be enough to carry her away. She feels so light and airy. The cheers of joy from the ship and the light pouring down the ramp seems more like the path to eternal paradise than the entrance to a transport, but she numbly climbs up instead, expecting to meet her ancestors, but as she wanders in, she instead sees her daughters, amazingly alive and although bearing numerous scars and signs of hurt, there was nothing she could imagine more beautiful. Tears flow freely and she rushes towards her surviving children to hug them close, weeping in joy, in relief, and with a strange new feeling burning inside her. She later knew to call it hope. Far away there is a large citadel made out of stolen and broken spaceships cobbled together into a weapon-strewn tower. A large amount of boats begin to pull away in the night, many of them towing other boats as they go. None are left behind as numerous freed prisoners celebrate in near total silence. In the distance, a single mountain poking out of the water has much the same happening to it as from its hollowed out core, a fleet of ships move out. On both of them, a beacon blinks merrily, as above the clouds, the EFL Tiger readies its recently stolen and upgraded weapons. Compared to most ships its sized, the Tiger is somewhat underarmed but is availed of numerous boarding torpedo launchers. Regardless, it still has several capital-scale weapons that are now pointing downwards to two separate locations and just waiting for the signal. A signal it receives and the clouds boil away to nothingness as the massive lasers burn into the center of both structures and hit the water filling the center. Those that weren't killed in the massive laser beams are scalded to death near instantly by the steam that flash cooks everything alive in the pirate fortresses. A distance away, the villages of Portwin, Scaleway, and Shellgather watch in fear. Nothing good had ever come from the rusted monument or the hollowed mountain. The backlight of the lasers reveal the approaching fleets, each splitting into three and heading to one of the villages before pulling into the docks. Large crowds gather holding what few weapons they have, mostly bits of metal with a heavy head or a sharp point. Some few have old and badly maintained laser pistols. Then everything changes. The strange figures controlling the boats surrender. To the last, they each surrender, and when asked why, the explanation stuns them. The boats are theirs, theirs to use, theirs to fish with, to live with, to protect with. It takes a few moments for it to sink in and then jubilation starts to run through the crowds even as some of the strangers break from boats to reveal themselves as stolen and missing family members returned. The pirates are dead and gone. They're safe, they're protected, and will be taught to better protect themselves. 
The peoples rush out onto the ships and many of them quickly find which are the ones that had been stolen before and which belonged to the pirates to begin with, taken as compensation for damages done. Many rush back to their homes to retrieve the nets and traps they had cared for in what is no longer a furtive dream of the boats being returned. The fish, unfarmed for so long, fill the nets near to bursting and the fire pits, formerly barely more than embers to heat tiny morsels they could scavenge from the shallows, are now stoked into blazing bonfires. The strangers, these heroes of the night, are all suddenly guests of honor and offered the first round. To the last, the food is passed instead to the elders of the communities with the request that they thrive and survive upon Vuxa, not to flee, but to stay and rebuild better than ever. To the last, they vow it so. The Vekwes couldn't chase them off. The Scorchin and Lean could not scare them away. Now the pirates failed to starve them. Of course they were staying. It would take the world breaking into pieces to move them. Then they feast. Introductions are had. The former pirates and now planetary conquerors of the EFL Tiger are somewhat nerve-wracking to be around but all quickly conquer their fear. The Chainbreaker bounty hunters are regarded as heroic champions alongside their commander brethren. At the words of these strange not tret men, the pirates are hailed as conquering heroes and all begin speaking of the future, of the days to come and hope. Bellies fill and feet grow worn in dancing as throats grow ragged in unending song. Already the more story-focused of the villages begin weaving tales about the tiger and chainbreaker which grow rapidly more and more incredible with each retelling. Every comment and addition from the saviors simply adds more and more fuel to the fire of absurd legends as the laughter and song-filled night. Then stories are begged of the saviors and they begin spinning their own tales. The not trets, the humans, speak of a great journey from the depths of greatest darkness and into the light, of harrowing danger, of pirate attacks turned against the pirates and friends made first at the muzzle of a weapon, then in profit and camaraderie. The chainbreakers speak of daring do, of chasing down and matching the worst of the worst with guile, cunning and brutality. How any amount of axiom power or personal viciousness can be conquered with a plan and a steady comrade at arms. Great beasts are boasted as slain from both sides and belts, and boots made of the monsters, hides are shown off as proof. Great flying beasts capable of breathing fire captured alive, then butchered for meat as it had done to children. Enormous semi-metallic titans that hunted in packs are the counter. A chase through impossible canyons to bait a flawless trap is met with the tales of being the bait themselves with nothing but clothing meant to allure and the rings that aided in the shaping of Axiom. The capture of a gang of murderesses who would turn every sound you made into another knife to flinch you with is set up against the utter destruction of a weapon distributor's entire organization in the span of a heartbeat. The stories grow and spin and stretch and shift. Before the hour is up, the only thing that the three villages agree upon is that titans walk among mortals and they are shifting all of Vuxa to greater and grander things.